Welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. This is our second episode for broadcast, and if you're watching it live the first time it appears, then this would be the week after Thanksgiving in 2022. So I hope you had a good holiday. Um, hope you got to spend it with people you love, and uh, you were nice and safe. And now thank you for joining us again as we explore further what is happening here in the world around us and what does it really mean. So I'm Steve Hicks. I am the Director of Podcast Ministries for Talking Donkey International, which is a media company. We are delighted to bring the gospel to you in this format, but to make sure that you continue to receive it, you need to subscribe to wherever you're watching this right now. So if it's Facebook, make sure you like the Something's Happening Here page, and that will make you a follower of that page. And if you're watching it on a different platform, then make sure you hit whatever subscribe option is there. We want you to make sure that you are going to continue to get this, especially this week's episode. Um, we're, we're, in for a, we're in for a treat this, this week. It's going to be a little challenging, I think. We're going to talk uh, about some stories that are happening, but it will lead us to a topic that a lot of people have very strong feelings about, and it's not universally agreed upon in the world. So uh, buckle up, <laughs> and we're, we're going to have a good time today. We're going to start today with an article that uh, was dated last week, so it's about a week old by this point, but the headline is, Doctor Tells of Cases Where Lost Loved Ones Reveal Things in Dreams and Then They Come True. So we're going to talk about ghosts and spirits and death uh, on this particular episode. Now, I know that's not a great subject. <laughs> Fear of death is like everybody's number two fear, somehow number two to the number one fear, which is public speaking. I don't fully understand that, but that's how it is. So I know this is not a fun topic, but as I said, it's a topic everybody has strong feelings about one way or another way or another way. So we're going to see what's happening in the world, and then we're going to see how that matches up to what God says about it in the scriptures. So let's read from this article here. It starts by saying, as many as 20 to 40 percent of Americans believe they have communicated with the dead, multiple studies report. Are all of these participants in a state of delusion, or have they really made contact with the other side? Then it goes on from there, and um, a few paragraphs down, we're talking, the article is interviewing a, a doctor who specializes in these alleged after-death communications, and uh, this doctor says, after-death communication can help mourners. Um, this doctor and some other psychologists have been exploring this phenomenon as a method of treating grief. As a method of treating grief. And so this is a medical procedure, or at least a psychological procedure in a scientific medical context. The article continues, in 1995, Dr. Alan Botkin developed a therapy method called Induced After-Death Communication, or IADC, apparently, for short. One of his patients learned something from an induced vision where she saw her deceased friend, which suggests the experience was real and not an illusion. Uh, and I don't really know why that suggests that it was real and not an illusion, um, but that is the claim the article makes. And so it goes on from there, and the, the point of the article is to show us or, or to make the claims that there is more to life than just this kind of physical life that we are living right now, and that on the other side of this final phenomenon of death is something greater than we understand, right? So if the doctors can tap into something on the other side that helps people on this side, then it must be good. There's a little bit later on in the article that, that kind of acknowledges that not everybody sees this the same way, um, but the overall point here is to give us comfort that when we lose a loved one, um, getting in touch with them somehow by some process could bring us comfort and could bring us peace. Now, how does that stack up? We're actually going to start not in the scriptures, although we will get there, but I want to start in the comments 
to this article? How do people react to this idea? And just like I said, not everybody understands this topic the same way. That's reflected in these comments as well. So I'm going to start with uh, one, and I know these are public comments, but you're not going to look them up, so I'm not going to read the usernames or anything like that. But there is one comment on this article, and it says, Our lost loved ones are always with us. They see, hear, and know everything that we say and do. I absolutely know this for a fact. There is way more to heaven and life after uh, than that book which I assume means the Bible, that book or preachers, no, get spiritual. Okay, well, obviously we disagree with that entire premise here at Something's Happening Here because we are looking to the Bible to find the ultimate truth. So anybody who claims that there is a truth beyond the scriptures uh, does not see these issues eye to eye with us here at this podcast. Here's why. Because the scriptures do not support what this person said. He or she, I don't know if the man or woman, but this person says, Our lost loved ones are always with us. They see, hear, and know everything we say and do. But scripture says, and we're going to find this in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. It's really one of the most plain statements on this matter in the whole Bible. Uh, scripture says, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And so scripture is telling us plainly there that the lost loved ones are not in fact always with us except in our own memories, but... Scripture goes so far as to say even our memories will someday fade, right? Because I too will die and then my memories will not be here anymore. Um, this user says they see, hear, and know everything that we say and do, but Scripture says they have no more reward here under the sun. Um, their love, their hatred, their envy have perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. So clearly there's a disconnect between this person's idea of the subject and what the scripture uh, claims on the subject. Now, before I go forward, I want to acknowledge that despite how plain those two verses are that I just read, not every Christian sees this issue this way. Um, in fact, most Christians in the world um, see it a little bit more complicated than these two verses uh, make it out to seem. What I'm going to do in, these, in this episode, in the segments this week, is not to really enter into all of that controversy. Um, I just want to state what the Bible says as it matches up with this topic in the world around us. And maybe in the future, we can create some sort of other program where we get into the, the nitty gritty, right? This scripture says this, but this scripture appears to say a different thing. How do we understand it, right? In a more in-depth Bible study than we have time for in this format right now. But I just want to acknowledge that from the beginning. There is, there is a greater theological discussion about this subject, even from the pages of the Bible, than we can have in this format right here. So... At most, I'm trying to whet our appetites uh, rather than to give a full explanation. But anyway, let's go to another comment here. <clears throat> Same article, and this person says, If you are visited in a dream by a loved one, and the outcome is peace and comfort, then how can it be the devil? I don't think the devil is in the business of giving comfort. It's pretty a pretty simple idea, right? The devil is evil. He must be out to hurt you. But does the Bible agree with that? From 2 Corinthians. So this is even a New Testament book, unlike Ecclesiastes, right? A uh, New Testament book of 2 Corinthians out of chapter 11. I'm reading verse 14. The Apostle Paul, who is the author here, says, And no wonder... For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
The Bible just told us the devil can imitate godly things. He can masquerade as one of God's holy angels. He can show up and do good things all day long because it's not actually biblically accurate to say the devil is always evil and he just wants to harm you. I mean, even the Bible does say he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. But nonetheless, if he can pull you away from God by being nice to you, that's what he'll do. His real goal is to pull you away from God, however he can do that. And so I disagree with this comment that if we receive a vision that brings us comfort, it must be from God or it cannot be from the devil. I don't think that, I don't think the Bible supports that. Um, we have to test everything against the Bible because the Bible is here telling us the devil can impersonate anybody he wants. So our own feelings are not a good enough litmus test, so to speak. Um, all right, let's go to another comment here. And this one is a little bit of a different comment. I think you'll see why I'm reading it in just a moment here. This person says, actually, if people read their entire Bible, they would see that when we die, the body turns to dirt. The breath returns to God who gave it. No form of existence until Jesus returns. Then the dead in Christ are raised. That, that, that's, that's a pretty theologically accurate statement as far as I'm concerned. And he, that's not the whole comment. He goes on off the rails a little bit. He goes into his understanding of how the plain teachings of scriptures turned into this kind of miasma of confusion on the subject all across Christianity and his, <laughs> his history is a little inaccurate. So I'm not going to read the rest, but he starts off with a good theology. The Bible actually does say at the moment of death, the body goes back to dirt and the spirit that animates the body goes back to God who gave it. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure I can even give you a text on that. I think that's Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So give me just a moment here. Ecclesiastes, meet me in chapter 12, and I bet you it's even verse 7. Yeah, at the moment of death, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. There you go. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. So I would agree with that statement. The reason I'm bringing it up is not to argue the comment, but to point out the reactions to the comment, whereas the two previous that I read already are supported. Thumbs up, thumbs up. This one has no thumbs up and multiple thumbs down because most people are not terribly interested in what God has to say on any given subject. We are in love with our own ideas. And in the minds of a lot of people, if God shows up with different ideas, we choose our own ideas instead, which is a really dangerous theological thing to do. But we're seeing that play out in the comments section of this article here. And I'm gonna give you one more of these comments before we move on. And that one is right here at the top of the list. This person who is apparently a woman, she says, three days after my husband died, he appeared to me in the afternoon. He said, I love you more than I could have ever loved you on earth. We all love here the same. I assume that means in heaven. Everybody up in heaven loves the same. But the father, meaning God, God the father, will comfort you now. That, that's what this dead husband apparently said in this vision. So now her commentary is, I had been crying and saying, you promised me you'd comfort me. So I pray that this telling of my story comforts someone else now. She was yelling at her dead husband because he left her, even though he promised to comfort her. And then this apparition appeared and said, yeah, I, I can't love you anymore. <laughs> because that's the father's job now. Even though, even though I have the capacity to love you more now after death than I could have before my death. Nonetheless, that's still God the father's job now. Go to him for comfort. Bye. To me, 
I mean, I'm not in this woman's position, but to me, that seems almost um, like that would make me angry. <laughs> if my spouse who passed away came back and said, I can love you even more now than I used to be able to, but I'm going to pass that, that ball off to someone else and go speak to God about it because not, that's not my job anymore. That would make me more angry than peaceful just from my own personal position here. But the reason I bring up this comment is because I'm going to read another scripture from Genesis chapter 3. And tell me if it, I mean, to me, that just like smacks me across the face. So let's read it together. Genesis chapter 3. This is the story. Uh, if you know kind of the Old Testament at all, then you will know this story. But if you're new to it, then this is the Adam and Eve story. The Bible claims that God made the world in a perfect way, and the people that he made, Adam and Eve, were perfect, and everything was perfect until they failed the only test that he gave. God had set up one tree in this lush, beautiful, infinite garden and said, eat anything you want, go anywhere you want, do anything you want, just don't eat from this one tree. And then the devil shows up and lies to Eve about it and tricks her, and then she ends up eating the the fruit from that tree, gives some to Adam, he eats it too. They both are subject now to sin, and it plunges the entire world into sin and death. So that's the kind of origin story of why everything is so terrible now from the pages of the Bible. But look at the lie that the devil feeds to Eve to get her to disobey. And compare it to this woman's comment that I just read you from this article. Okay? I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 of the book of Genesis. The, the setting is the Garden of Eden and this perfection. And uh, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Which, of course, is not what God had said. He had said way back in chapter 2, verse 16, that of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the devil shows up and says, hey, did God really say that you don't have complete freedom here? God had said they do have complete freedom except for one little restriction. And the devil turns that little restriction into a great big, like, injustice. What do you mean you can't just eat anything? So verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Pay attention to what the devil says to her now to trick her. Verse 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You're going to be more like God after you die because death is not really death, right? God says, You will surely die. The devil says, No, 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 don't worry about it. You will not really die. After this thing that we call death, you'll be more like God, more able to love your spouse after death than you could before death. So don't even, don't even worry about that little thing called death. And so that is the lie that plunged the entire world into sin and death and chaos. And that exact same lie is being repeated by this poor woman in the comment section of this article. And so for our opening segment, that's, I'm really just establishing this problem. The Bible has one point of view on this. In fact, it's the same point of view that goes back to Genesis chapter three. And yet it, that those ideas are still the, the opposing ideas, the, the ideas that the devil fed to Eve are still alive and well they're still even in our medical and psychiatric fields of study and, and, and ministry towards people, as we're reading in this article, and they're still alive and well in the hearts and the minds of the people, like this woman and the others who wrote these comments. 
it reminds me of a show that was on TV for about three years. It was called Crossing Over. And it was a show um, where a man who claimed to be a psychic would put on these performances <laughs> and he would claim to know things that he could not possibly know about people he had never met before. And at the time, this was before I was a practicing Christian and I was very confused and concerned and a little bit frightened about the concept of death. And I used to like this show. I used to watch it because it gave me some sort of comfort that this mystery called death was not really the end. And there was something just on the other side of it that was accessible and comforting. I'm glad that I learned better. Because the Bible doesn't support any of that. So please come back in our future segments of this episode because we have a lot more to say on this topic. Where we've just scratched the surface here, and we are going to explore this problem from a number of different avenues. So, again, please make sure you're fully subscribed to this page or wherever you're watching this on, on whatever platform. And come back tomorrow as we continue this discussion. I'm Steve Hicks, Director of Podcast Ministries for, for Talking Donkey International, and this has been Something's Happening Here. May God bless you.